Hello and welcome to Dialogue Sunday Gospel Study this October 25th, 2020. Today we are joined by Professor Rebecca Rosler, who will be uh, focusing on 3rd Nephi 27 and 4th Nephi. Um, I'm Chris Kimball. I'm conducting today on behalf of the Dialogue Foundation Board from my home in, in the Uinta Mountains in Utah. Um, other board members, Michael Austin and Rebecca Deschweinitz, are also part of our group today. We're using, as always, we're using our webinar format on Zoom and running a live stream on Facebook. We're recording the program and we'll post the recording this afternoon when it is available. For viewers on Zoom, there's a chat function by which you can comment, ask questions, and propose answers. We ask that you be courteous and thoughtful about the chat. We will refer to it later when we have a time and an opportunity for questions and answers. The chat room is recorded, and uh, anything you say there will be uh, known for posterity. More than, talking about dialogue now for a minute, more than 50 years of Dialogue content, articles, essays, poetry, art is available online at dialoguejournal.com and also at JSTOR, including these Dialogue Sunday study sessions, which have been posted at YouTube for past weeks and are linked at dialoguejournal.com. If you're enjoying these Dialogue Sunday study sessions, please consider supporting Dialogue by subscription or donation. We'll include an, an email address and a um, an online address and a text number. I also want to give you a picture of where we're going. We started these Dialogue Sunday study sessions in response to the COVID-19 shutdown with the brilliant support of Taylor Petrie, our current Dialogue editor, and an incredible, mm, I'm just so impressed with what our teachers have been able to do in these um, weeks and months past, using the, common, uh, the Come Follow Me Book of Mormon readings for 2020. We're planning program through Sunday, December 13, which will take us to the end of the Book of Mormon. And, and those lessons are, are in, the, in the works. We'll, we'll be with you through the middle of December and till the holidays come. Including next week, um, to mention it now with Dr. Louis, Louise Wheeler, who is an assistant clinical professor and assistant director of diversity and inclusion at the BYU Counseling and Psychological Services. In the, at the same time, in the meantime, we are transitioning to a new exciting program of monthly fireside presentations beginning this evening. This Sunday evening uh, today with Thomas Griffith, who will be speaking tonight on a Latter-day Saint approach to politics. The time for that is 8 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. Mountain Time, and uses the same webinar format and the same links that you hopefully have become familiar with by this programming. Um, join us this evening for that. Um, now, I'd like to, now I'd like to introduce today's program. We are joined today by Dr. Rebecca Rosler, Becky Dr. Rosler is a professor of violin and music education at Brigham Young University, Idaho. She received a PhD in music and human learning from the University of Texas in Austin and bachelor's and master's degrees from Brigham Young University. Dr. Rosler has presented her research at conferences for the National Association for Music Education, the American String Teachers Association, and the International Research Symposium on Talent Education and her articles appear in the Journal of Research in, of Music, in uh, Journal of Research in Music Education, Journal of Music Teacher Education, Music Educators Journal, and American String Teacher. Her research investigates the problem-solving process during music teaching and learning, and collaborative problem-solving during rehearsal. Additional research interests include motor skill learning, attention, and automaticity. Occasionally she lapses into Mormon studies topics and hopefully that's occasionally is today um, to add spice. She has presented at the Mormon History Association and Book of Mormon Studies Association and has published in dialogue. She has taught many wonderful teenagers during very early morning seminary and joins us today to talk about the Book of Mormon. Um, I'm going to introduce the whole of our program today 
As you might expect with a music educator teaching today, Dr. Rosler has selected music as an integral part of the lesson. Anticipating requests, we do intend to include links to the music on the chat. I'm going to announce the prayers all now so that once we start, I don't have to come back on and interrupt again and the program can continue um, with, with, Dr., with the flow that Dr. Rosler has designed. Our invocation will be offered by, the, by L. Ray Henriksen. L. Ray Henriksen served as a sergeant in the Norwegian Air Force before doing an undergraduate degree in peace and development studies at Bradford University in the United Kingdom, and then a master's degree in peace operations at George Mason University in Washington, DC. He worked for a year for the United Nations in Burundi and for Norwegian church aid for eight years before moving to Brussels, where he now lives with his husband. In Brussels, he completed another master's degree in European communications. A 70 in Community of Christ, he currently works as a full-time volunteer for the church and chairs the European Peace and Justice Team. And our benediction will be offered by Christine Anderson. Christine is an accounting graduate of BYU-Idaho, returned to Rexburg 12 years later, mid-certainty crisis, and has been a participant in online Mormonism, Mormon activism, and Mormon studies ever since. She currently spends most of her time juggling the demands of three toddlers under three and fits in as much scholarship and activism as she can, as she can focusing on marginalized students in Rexburg. We'll begin today with music, uh, a piece called A City Called Heaven, sung by Jubilant Sykes. God of wonder, God of light, we present our humble bodies, our minds and our hearts to know you better through the scriptures and the insights that are found in 4th Nephi today. Make us partakers of the heavenly gift and teach us how to share all things in common with those that have not received according to their needs. Help us to always give back according to our capacity. Help us rebuild our lives where things have been shattered and relationships have been torn apart. Help us to mourn over the places in our lives where we have sunken so deep into depression, fear, or hatred that renewal has proven difficult. In this hour, we pray that we may no longer be divided by politics nor by identity, neither by fear of the other nor by any form of ism. Let us no longer look for what separates us from each other. Diversity is part of creation Instead, help us be eager to seek out the divine in all of our siblings, for that is what we are to each other when we call you God, the creator of all, our most compassionate parent who runs towards us and embraces the prodigal children that we are, for we have all gone astray at some point in our lives, and yet each of us are found and continuously reclaimed by you in Christ. And may we, if only for a brief moment, catch the glimpse of your peace among us when we feel the perfect union that we can experience with you, with creation and with each other through the ministry of the Holy Spirit in the midst of our relationships as it touches our hearts and frees our minds to what is possible. In the name of Jesus who saves, amen. All right, thank you. And that's about all we need. That's the lesson. If we can achieve that, then we've accomplished what I hope we would accomplish today. Such a beautiful encapsulation of the ideals of fourth Nephi. I feel like we just close now. I am so glad to have Elry with us and to introduce many of you to him and him to you. He is a kind friend and deep soul, one who works to make the world a better place every day. He has a peaceable walk with those around him. And in an almost a literal sense, he's my spiritual cousin. He, uh, it turns out in my family line, my parents are both converts, but in my family line, my dad's line has Navu Mormons in it. But I learned only a couple years ago that there were brothers and cousins that were baptized our LDS in independence in the 1860s and knew Joseph Smith III and Emma and in fact, uh, by marriage, my cousin-in-law, I guess, uh, spoke at Emma 
Smith Vitamins funeral. So I feel a kinship uh, with El Rey and uh, with both of these organizations. Um, it's, it's uh, I, I think, a beautiful connection there. And I'm so grateful for Michael and Taylor and Rebecca and Chris and everyone who's presented and that have made these sessions possible every Sunday morning. It's one of the best things to come out of this pandemic, uh, in my this horrible pandemic, in my humble opinion. And I was also so thrilled to share with you Jubilant Sykes' rendition of A City Called Heaven. I heard him first when I was 17 years old, and I was just struck by the power of his expression. It was pure expression with I mean, maybe a little voice on top and soul-to-soul um, -soul communication, which I wish we could all do. And spirituals, of course, are amazing and heartrending. They blend suffering and uh, hope in, in a way that I don't know what else does. Uh, so much suffering and so much, yet, yet so, so much hope and the realities and yet the ideals. And that's actually so much of what I've been wrestling with here as I've prepared the last couple of weeks considering and thinking about this text from third Nephi into fourth Nephi into Mormon, within the Book of Mormon, um, this disintegrating society that we see at the, the beginning of Third Nephi, that then uh, becomes this beautiful united society with justice and equality, and then in only a few verses disintegrates into a dystopian uh, or toward a dystopian society. Um, but there are these beautiful ideals expressed and I have wrestled with the ideal as it related to my own life in the last couple of weeks, the, the realities of my own life. And um, so much in these passages is left unsaid. The realities of life are left unsaid, but maybe that's okay. I mean, maybe the, all the questions that come to mind and. There, I have so many questions. Maybe that's part of the design of the passage to allow us to work out the details on our own. I mean, I love questions. At certain periods of my life, I have felt that God guided me in the form of a question. And um, I also, when I teach my students, they know that one of their assignments is to come with questions, that that's what I expect from them. So questions are wonderful. Questions are a gift. They're genuine. They're honest. And to me, in a way, questions are the, one of the most honest places to be, um, sometimes more than answers. And I do. I have so many questions. And maybe you can consider some questions of your own as you consider these passages. You might consider what about this society in fourth Nephi is valuable to you, to me? What may not be? Is there anything you would change or add? You might reflect on a time you felt belonging and connectedness or division and strife or a time when reconciliation and peace were achieved. How did that happen? I especially appreciated Tom Christofferson's words last week relating his experience coming out to his family and the challenges they experienced, but also how they worked through that. And I wonder how it happened in the divisions, from, from the divisions of 3rd Nephi 6 and 7, where society's pull, falling apart, and then they transform into the unity of 4th Nephi. We have no character dialogue from this time, no actual person-to-person -person interactions. What was it like? What, it, what did it mean that they had no contention? Large scale, small scale, what does that actually look like? Was there literally no arguing, no conflict? Did everyone just agree? Or were there both diversity and unity, variation and equality? How did they achieve it? Whatever it was. Was this the effect that a redeemer could have on people, on peoples? What do we do when our society is fractured? Our community, our community of associates, our friends and associates, when events or revelations tear apart 
your knowledge of one another. What do you do if you just don't think someone is funny or tries to be? What if you're not funny? I'm not funny. What do we do when we're in these interactions that are more challenging? What do you do when you just don't know who to trust or whether you can trust anyone? When not just tools and weapons and money become slippery, but our sense of one another, our sense of self, how do we heal? How do we restore self? How do we restore one another to one another? I did a project a couple years ago examining the Book of Mormon as refutational text. Now, quick crash course on refutational text. It's actually a term used in research in educational psychology, the psychology of learning, looking at, especially at um, texts in science education. Um, the idea is that refutational text will take a misconception and a conception and, and refute the misconception directly with the conception right next to it. The idea is that, and by the way, the, the research all over the place shows that the refutational text, as opposed to just declarative text, meaning they just talk about stuff, um, is far more effective at enacting conceptual change in a mind. Um, so Relational text takes these two things and puts them in direct pass with one another, which allows the mind uh, to actually work with them in working memory, or in other words, our, our thinking space at the same time. They have to be called up at the same time. So I did a project looking at refutational text, the Book of Mormon, and um, it is all over the place. It is clearly a book that desires to change our thinking. And their refutational text appears all over the place uh, covering many topics. For instance, um, prayer, you know, if you don't feel like you should pray, that's wrong, that's the devil, pray, you should pray. That's, you, you refute the, the misconception and then um, you replace it with a desired conception or habit or attitude. All over the place in many topics, but by far the most frequent topic covered uh, in, in refutational language especially, is the treatment of the poor, the attitude toward wealth and riches and clothing, and the stratification of society through that set of uh, concerns and issues as far as the quality of society. Um, so I, and I had considered it, as I did this uh, analysis of the Book of Mormon text, I had considered 4th Nephi as sort of a reverse refutational text where we have the positive, the desired ideal in direct contrast with the later negative, the, the dissolution of those ideas. Um, however, what I discovered this week is that it's actually a three-part refutation. Um, I'm going to share if this is working. Of course, tell me if it's not. Share my screen here and show you this is gonna be a lot of words, but I promise I'll walk you through it here. Um, so we have in third Nephi chapters six and seven, by the way, Michael Ng's uh, Sunday school on this a month ago or so was wonderful. Um, back on these words and what we see is the words of fourth Nephi in reverse almost exactly in 35, six and seven, and also again in reverse in the latter part of fourth Nephi. So for instance, in, in the 20 and ninth year, there began to be some disputings among the people and some were lifted up unto pride and boastings. This is 35, six, because of their exceedingly great riches, yea, even unto great persecutions. And the people began to be distinguished by ranks according to their riches and their chances for learning. Some were ignorant because of their poverty, poverty and others did receive great learning because of their riches. And thus there became a great inequality in all the land. And in the next chapter, we see again, the, the society just totally breaks apart. The people were divided one against another and they did separate one from another into tribes. Now here, it's actually interesting, the Book of Mormon sort of says, there's, they sort of have peace because they're not fighting. But as we'll talk about a little bit later, that's not really peace 
totally, especially in, in um, the theories presented by Galtung. And uh, then we have a utopian-ish society. Um, and again, I'm, I'm using that word carefully and I'm interested in, in your thoughts on even just considering this as a utopia or would you change or add anything to this utopia ish society. Um, they had all things common among them, every man dealing justly one with another. And it came to pass that they did all, do all things even as Jesus had commanded them. And by the way, this, this starts in 35, 26. So it's as Jesus, it's, it's kind of at the end or somewhere in there, as Jesus is ministering to them, they begin this practice of having all things common and that beautiful phrase, dealing justly one with another. And then fourth Nephi, very similar language. There were no contentions. They did deal justly. Every man or person did deal justly one with another. And they had all things common among them. Therefore, there were not rich and poor or made free. And it came to pass later on in the, uh, the text, there, there was no contention the land because of God, which did dwell in the hearts of the people. There were no envyings, nor strifes. There were no, no Lamanites, nor any manner of ites, but they were in one. So we have these, this contrast distinguished by ranks, riches, pride, boastings, divided one against another, great inequality, and all the opposite. Um, and then, of course, in only a few verses, but it's actually a couple centuries, there began to be Lamanites again. Um, there's uh, wearing of costly apparel. The goods and substance were more in common uh, among them. They began to be divided into classes. And then in 30 Nephi 27, the Savior is um, uh, prophesying what will happen in, in the fourth generation, as we see in 4 Nephi. This is really haunting. In the fourth generation, they will sell me for silver and for gold. So it is a tragedy, but I thought this very interesting. Of course, the Book of Mormon, we don't see 3rd Nephi 6 against 4th Nephi because it's not in proximity to one another. We have only a few years, but this beautiful, um, much, uh, a great deal of text where the Savior is ministering to the people. And so, there is a, uh, we don't, we don't put that together, but I'm doing that for you. So um, doing that refutational text for you. I wanted to highlight just a few of these phrases and sort of center the rest of the lesson over uh, our discussion around, around these. Um, one uh, I would like to highlight is this wonderful, there were not rich and poor, bond and free, but they were all made free. Um, again, this is one of the main concerns of the entire Book of Mormon, that this might be possible uh, or, or considered. I wonder if it's possible. Is it possible? That's one of my questions. Um, interesting, too, is insight um, at, at uh, Book of Mormon Studies Conference a couple of weeks ago, there was a interesting presentation by Steve Peck, and he was um, presenting evidence that there may have been a slave culture, uh, a, a, a slave, slavery, although not overtly stated in the Book of Mormon text, evidence for it. And this is an interesting evidence in which the, there's a contrast from perhaps what happened before that there in this society, there wasn't bond and free, and then there were some who needed to be made free. Um, also, um, <clears throat> the, the, the idea that there is no rich, but there is no poor, that there's, there's an equal uh, society. I'm curious about any, any, anything you have to say about that. Um, this phrase, every person did deal justly one with another. I believe Patrick Mason mentioned this in his Sunday school lesson on the, what we call the war chapters uh, a couple months ago. Uh, the, the wonderful peace studies theorist Galtung states that peace isn't just not fighting. It's, it's a structural, structural peace uh, is where 
there is not latent violence. There's no threat. There's no um, there's no situation in which someone is below another that there is justice done to every person. And interesting, Martin Luther King, at the end of his life, one of the things he was most uh, concerned with, one of his uh, main uh, concerns was to lift those who were economically disadvantaged to be able to create a just society for all. And then of course, this was shortly before he was, he was killed. Um, I'm so thrilled, like I said, to have Elray with us. And I, I want to have him share some experiences about, uh, related to his experience in the community of Christ and what he was able to accomplish uh, as, as part of the community of Christ as related to, or, or at least their mission, right? As related to creating a peaceful and just society. So I'm gonna just turn it over to you, Elray, for a few minutes. Uh, thank you, Becky. Um, let me see, perhaps I can use my video and see if that works. How are we doing on sound? Is it better, any better? I think we're okay. Yeah. So I'd be happy to share a few thoughts uh, on my personal experience in Community of Christ and on the work we do there to cultivate peace, but also to create Zion, which is a common theme for, for both our denominations. Community of Christ has had a long tradition for wanting to gather in the center place in Independence, Missouri. Uh, our headquarters, auditorium, and most recent temple dedicated to peace, reconciliation, and healing of the, of the spirit are located there. We also keep the Kirtland Temple in our care in Illinois, so history in our shared restoration tradition is important to us as well. I actually grew up in the LDS tradition in Europe, in Switzerland and Norway. And yet it was the work of building Zion as a child and teenager that spoke the most to me in the LDS tradition. Peace, peace was important. This particular emphasis has continued to grow over the years and even more so after I met Community of Christ at the beginning of my thirties. And I believe my understanding has expanded somewhat since then. Perhaps it's important to remember that the reorganization was a part of a continuation of our movement after the scattering of the saints across the Midwest following the assassination of Joseph and Hiram Smith in 1844. Community of Christ's early members were a dissenters group who rejected what was according to them uh, an authoritarian leadership and they were fiercely opposed to polygamy. So there was uh, a lot of conflict within our own uh, movement at the time. Several of the early members in, in Community of Christ claimed to have had personal divine encounters that guided them in reorganizing the saints left behind after the exodus of Mormon pioneers to Utah. Most of you might be familiar with this, but ironically, the reorganization eventually gathered around Joseph Smith's son, Joseph III. And this is where a lot of the emphasis on peace starts. It's important to remember that Joseph III was 12 when his father and uncle were assassinated. He saw the grief of his mother in addition to feeling his own grief. And his family stayed in Nauvoo even though many were driven out in 1846. And eventually he became the mayor of Nauvoo. He saw that accommodation with his neighbors was possible and necessary. And when he became leader of the reorganization, the USA was plunged into five years of the American Civil War. By the end, he and others understood the awful reality of war. Joseph Smith III led the reorganization for 54 years, from 1860 to 1914. And this is, in this period, he had the chance to form what is a, a what I consider to be a peace tradition in the restoration. In multiple ways, he had, he, he, uh, he was, uh, faced with very difficult situations, including uh, by, by being located where he was, to forgive Thomas Sharp, the person probably more than anyone else who was responsible for his father's death. Community of Christ in the beginning of his peace mission was born out of this tragic, tragic failure of violence and the influence of a Christian mother and Joseph Smith's the third's own reason commitments. So peace is not created with your friends, but with your enemies. Uh, Nelson Mandela said it best, perhaps, if you want to create peace with your enemy, you have to work with your enemy. 
and then your enemy becomes your partner. And I, I do think that the same applies to Zion also in the context of fourth Nephi, as you, as you kind of have pointed out. Um, it was people on both sides of the traditional Lamanite Nephite divide that needed to change the way they thought of each other in order for there to be peace in all the land. It was never meant to be peace only here and only there as they kept separate from each other. I think it was meant to be peace together, to be one. Uh, so that's, that's some of the thoughts that I have uh, to kind of start with, uh, you know, our conversation here, but uh, I hope that uh, contributes in, in, in putting into perspective how Community of Christ uh, became a peace tradition in the Restoration. That's so beautiful. I, I saw Rebecca highlighted one phrase that I thought was so critical as well, is that peace is not created with your friend or really, but with, or with those you are in conflict with. And, and finding ways to, I know that's something you've studied, Delray, and I, I find it really, Delray and I were talking about how um, these two traditions, um, the, those who went to the Salt Lake Valley and those who stayed in Nauvoo um, had a very different way of engaging, uh, particularly those who stayed in Nauvoo had to stay there right next to, and, um, and so had to learn to engage with it, it was it was a necessity for them and um i thought it was a really wanted and um i thought that was important for us to consider as a means of creating peace is to engage with those with whom we are we may be in conflict <clears throat> i thought maybe we could pause and just see if there's anything um we want to i'm curious where i haven't seen much of the chat i'm curious where um people are going in their thoughts and questions um so is that okay if we sort of pause and take a look at what what uh, you're saying what you I don't know. There, <clears throat> come off mute. That's wonderful. I think I think we will have um, more comments and questions as we talk here a little bit. But the uh, one one concept or question is is really addressing why is Fourth Nephi so short? Um, it mm -hmm. makes it sound simple, and I think that's one of the what what can, what can we get out of this? What can we get out of this short book to um, to tell us how it's done? I guess that's uh... yeah. I'm. That's been what I. One of the things I've been wrestling with too. I mean, like I said, there's these ideals that are stated, and but we have so little information. I just have questions. How did they get there? What is is it by design that it's so short? Is it purposefully? Uh, making us sort of say, okay, this is an ideal, but how do you know wrestle that we have to wrestle with our own realities in our own ways? Clearly, we have a very divided society that, um, as Ellery was saying, these these two groups that have uh, two and or possibly more, of course, different histories. I mean, I I have only questions. Uh, what happened with their collective memory? Uh, for instance, they had different stories to tell as to what happened with Nephi, with the plates, with Zoram. You know, when when Nephi tackled Zoram, was was from volunteering or was he forced to come? You know, was what what happened to the plates? You know, and and they these two groups of people had very different histories as as um, uh, re related to how they came about and a lot of their conflict was sort of fed by those things how did they how did they reconcile those, those differences i have questions i don't know what the answers are because they're just not in the text i mean what 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 re, what what brought it about was it the fact that they all experienced destruction i mean that can be a unifying thing when we experience tragedy together right was was it partly because part of the population was a, apparently who were the least just wiped out well we don't have that luxury right we we live with our those we we we're in conflict with uh, or that are are not just uh, uh that and that's of course another discussion but um 
uh, or or was it the, the the simple effect and not simple but was it this effect of is this power of the savior and his presence in their lives was it that transformative those are all my questions and, and Ellery and I were talking about this as well yesterday as we were preparing and I, we thought perhaps that maybe it was this combination of all those things um external perhaps internal I'm curious any any thoughts people other other people have it's it's occurred to me uh, I always insert myself here it's occurred to me that the it's sometimes portrayed as though the direct experience with Christ has had an almost magical effect on society but but it's almost unbelievable that that could persist for generations for hundreds of years and that makes you think there's more to it or they learn something mm -hmm. or something happened that that allows this to continue for or makes it continue for generations for hundreds of years um questions are uh, questions i guess here are what do we take from the um sense of, of working with your enemies. Um, we have enemies today in, uh, in, in divisiveness in our, in our society. Um, and, and maybe Elray's narrative about, about those who stayed in Nauvoo is, is instructive there. Uh, but we also have countries and uh, I mean, we have a worldwide a set of conflicts. Uh, someone here mentions North Korea, and uh, I, I might add, you know, China. You could you could list a host of um, peoples and countries and circumstances that seem um, that that seem like enemies. That seem like a, a, a basis for conflict right now. Do we read this as encompassing the whole world? as a charge to us? Another thing that's it's so interesting is in the text, right? It's it's one nation that sets up a society with bond a little bit, not, not know any answers, but it, it is interesting how it does, it's, it's sustained over, you know, multiple generations. And it seems to be that there was something structural that's stable that set up that that makes it so stable it's 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 both internal i mean they, the love of god in the hearts of the people but they also have a society a, a structural society a, a, um what is, what's the word i'm trying to say but there's something in the way they've set up their their governance and their their the equality of society having their economic uh circumstance seems to also enable the sustain peace for, but I, it's interesting, though, it does not talk about engaging with other nations, other peoples. Um, it's just not there. And I, Elry would probably have more to say about uh, who has a degree in peace studies. Um, the, the work done on the macro scale in the world, um, there's beautiful things don't really hear about as much. We hear much more about war than we hear about peace, work in peace. Um, historically, current events, things like that. Um, but the, there, are, there are beautiful things that have been sort of in 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 quiet ways, um, as far as I think uh, peace and diplomacy with other nations, um, based on principles of uh, peace building. Uh, I don't know, Elray, did you have? Did you want to? You, you popped in there. Did you want to say anything about that? Uh. Yeah, actually, I mean, it's, it's just uh, just yesterday, for example, the 50th country uh, to ratify the treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons, which means that was Honduras. And that means that the, the, the treaty's entry into force is in three months, which means that on the 22nd of January 2021, nuclear weapons will be illegal under international law. So, so they are like... There are movements and people, this was, this was those who were involved with the uh, ICANN, uh, the International Campaign to Abolish Nuclear Weapons, who got the Nobel Peace Prize a few years ago. And, and they are celebrating these advances in international law that, that enable us to actually find ways now to, um, 
to to ban nuclear weapons something that we've been we've been struggling with as an international society for probably uh, you know since since 1945 so so it's i think that on the international level there's many things that can be done uh, and I do believe personally that the call to Zion or the cause of Zion is a call to something grander than uh, the uh, than our local community. Uh, but at the same time, that's where it starts. Uh, we have to start challenging ourselves uh, and start learning about peace and seeking inner peace as well. I mean, the, these are the these are kind of the building blocks of a peaceful society. So I'm I'm always very. Uh, uh, it's a roller coaster journey, I think, in terms of trying to work for peace, but uh, the rewards over years of uh, commitment can be quite uh, quite good. So I mean, that's that's some of the thoughts that I just came to mind. As, as we discussed. Wonderful. Oh, that, um, that can I take a little segue, uh, another small segue I wanted to, to talk about. And I think Rebecca, I can see in your mind, your eyes that there's more to talk about too. We'll come back to the chat in just a moment. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I think we're also um, uh, so, having some uh, sound cut out again. So we might want to try going back to the okay. video, but. Okay. Yeah, you bet. Um, so let me stop my video. Um, I'm sorry about my internet. It is, I live in rural Idaho, so sometimes it does weird things. Um, so I want, Ellery said something about um, where, you know, there's these wonderful things happening on the grand scale, right? On the macro. And of course there's difficult things happening there too. But he said where it starts is in ourselves and in our communities and our relationships. And I wanted to highlight another phrase that that's there in 4th Nephi uh, verse 17. It says, there were no envyings nor strifes. To me, that sounds more personal. Um, it sounds like there's, there's somehow, uh, I, I guess the, the, the words that I see along with envy is jealousy, right? I see pride and conflict. Envyings, and somehow people uh, are were able to achieve uh, something that that wasn't that. <laughs> and I'm trying to—I don't even know what that is necessarily. Where every person was uh, valuable, and again, having all goods in common um, was something uh, that uh, that sort of reduced the amount of comparison and envy. But I wonder if it was even something else as well, because it's not just about goods, right? It's it's about how we see ourselves in relation to our strengths, uh, in relation to our strengths or weaknesses and challenges and abilities. And of course, this is something we all constantly um, are, are challenged by. And I, I wanted to play, I wonder if Michael, this would be a good time, especially since my sound's still not going great. Um, I wanted uh, to play a, a little piece for my friend J.B. Hawes, his wonderful uh, called Wrestling with Comparisons. And this is a, a, it's it's a short, it's sort of a, well, forgive me, it's a little overproduced. Um, uh, there's, I, don't we all wish we had a soundtrack to everything we were saying, but um, he, it, it's a wonderful segment from his entire emotional, which I uh, recommend from Beautiful. Uh, I, all right. Um, you you had a little bit more to say and before before you you do. Um, and I I just wanted to um, highlight one other phrase in the Book of Mormon in Fourth Nephi, where it talks about not having any manner of ites, but they were in one. 
Um, and I wondered if Elray, you would you would say, uh, I think you had more to say about our previous discussion, and then also share your experiences with um, anxiety, right? Um, having uh, and connected, so. I, I didn't hear the last part here, Becky, but I'll still go ahead and share a bit what uh, uh, some of the thoughts that we prepared. And uh, there was this this uh, this aspect of uh, which I think is interesting. Uh, when I uh, first went to Community of Christ um, in Independence, Missouri, to their um, to our um, World Conference, uh, and this is following the tradition that Joseph Smith III had. Uh, had enabled debate in church conferences. He was unafraid of it, and he trusted good outcomes over the long term and a more united body. He presided pragmatically over a church of dissenters through common consent processes, something they coined as a theocratic democracy. So in this way, Community of Christ was a good fit for me. I saw myself as a dissenter too, having thought for a while critically about the role of violence in my life of faith, and at my baptism into Community of Christ in 2011, we sang the gospel hymn down by the riverside with the words, I ain't gonna study war no more. And um, so imagine my enthusiasm then when I was asked to travel as a delegate for my mission center in Europe to Independence, Missouri for a week long world conference held every three years. My Norwegian grandma used to call it Independence, Missouri. I was gobsmacked when I came to understand how the World Conference was going to unfold. Seriously, I kept asking my travel companions, when are the apostles and the first presidency going to talk? And the answer was always, they'll give a sermon here and there, but most of our time is conducted in many hours of business meetings, in plenary debates, and in our respective quorums and caucuses discussing. And I was utterly surprised by this. Any member with any concern at any time related to the topic at hand was allowed to share this concern with the rest of us in the conference room by approaching a lectern and we had to listen respectfully even when we disagreed and then seek to discern together prayerfully where the Holy Spirit wanted to proceed and move us forward together. This even included voting on new scripture to be included in Doctrine and Covenants. And this has not always been an easy path in Community of Christ. In 1984, when revelation was given about women in the priesthood, a large rift happened in the membership. Families, congregations, mission centers were divided, relationships were broken off. And I think we still feel the pain from that rift. But now, 2013, my first world conference, and a national conference was scheduled to be held just after the worldwide and week-long event, to decide together in the US whether or not LGBT members could be included in the priesthood and whether or not marriage ceremonies could be conducted for us. And I was nervous about the fate of the LGBT members in this room when we sat in the old chapel close to the temple lot. Would the body vote in favor of such a decision or not? And three years had gone into discerning, studying the scriptures prayerfully, discussing together and asking God, what the right thing was for the US conference to do and emotions were running high. And in our waiting, LGBT members sang a hymn for everyone born a place at the table. And I was in tears because the refrain exclaimed, and God will delight when we are creators of justice and joy, compassion and peace. All the years of heartache and pain left me and the sudden peace and reassurance of God's love came flowing over me. I was in a place I could call home. So I think it's strange in some way that here's an ex LDS recently baptized into community of Christ, still trying to find my footing as a gay Christian in Independence, Missouri, hoping that a policy would come to place to allow me to serve, minister, and be part of the whole body of Christ. A funny story is that during this very same conference, I decided to drive up to the temple in Independence and made by chance an LDS friend and her family who were visiting at the time of this world conference from Utah. And together we decided to, draw, to drive up to Liberty Jail and to Adam on the Ammon, a couple of LDS owned historical sites in the area. And there 
at Adam on the Am, and I called home to my LDS parents with my friend to let them know that the gathering had begun, that Jesus was again coming among us soon, very soon. And for a few minutes right there, right then, I believe that peace was possible and that Zion was not such a far-fetched idea, but something that we as restoration peoples needed to be anxiously engaged in, making God's vision of peace for the world a reality. And may I just add, the Zion equation, I call it, somebody here in the chat said, I'm not sure there is a Zion formula, but I kind of call it the Zion equation or the Zion formula, I think is a good word, is contained in the verses of fourth Nephi, one heart plus one mind equals zero poverty. What does that mean? I believe that heart and mind are actually verbs here and not nouns. We love each other. We understand each other. I love you and you love me. So I want what's best for you and you want what's best for me. I get you and you get me. So I don't have a mind to hurt you and you don't have a mind to hurt me. This settles our relationship. In this way, there are no poor and no oppressed among us because love is present in abundance and everyone is mindful of the other's needs. For me, that's what I call the Zion equation. Beautiful. Um, so many takeaways. I, I, you can see why I wanted El Ray to be with us today and how much he brings to this discussion on peace and unity and diversity. And um, uh, it, it is, it, it's a question that, it, again, the text doesn't, uh, I can't see in the text much grappling with diversity and unity, but many of you, I, I just glim glimpsing at the um, chat are saying, you know, it's, there's no, there's no conflict, but we can deal with it in a certain way. It's not that there's no diversity, but we we have a, a, a union or common shared values, um, shared uh, values as far as how we relate to one another is what I mean. Um, and I I loved what Elray said about how the individual's voice was important, uh, is important. I, I, um, I wonder if I can if I can be back with you, um, I with my orchestra students, um, this goes all the way back to when I taught middle school and junior high and high school orchestra and now with collegiate students, um, I'm constantly trying to help them in an orchestra feel that their individual voice matters. The Dr. Seuss, the great doctor says, every voice counts. And sometimes I'll even read Horton Hears a Who to my students to drive home that point that every individual is important, even though you feel like you're lost in a sea of other musicians. Um, but at the same time, it's important to know when another voice is more important at that time. Um, clearly, especially since my internet is going out, El Rey's voice has been important today. Um, and your voices on the chat have been important, um, not just my own. And in an orchestra, achieving balance, this is an actual musical um, term, balance in an orchestra is only achieved when certain voices come out uh, while other voices allow them to, and then that can shift to another voice is important at another time in a piece of music. And I wanted to share a, a, a clip from um, uh, Sharon Eubank from just this past conference on union of feeling, also discussing how individuals are important, but there's this amazing thing that can happen where um, I, she talks about finding swing in ro rowing where the individuals are able to find a union. Michael, is that okay if you play that clip from Sharon Eubank? Thank you. Good swing. Um, I wonder if Rebecca or Christian, uh, Chris, the, if there's anything more from the chat 
that uh, we'd like to just for a few minutes to, and then I'll I'll finish with um, with a, a final um, musical exploration. So. Yeah, so lots of really um, beautiful comments um, in response to a, a beautiful lesson. Um, I'm really, I'm, I'm glad that El Rey brought in um, some thoughts about thinking of, you know, there's no formula for Zion. Um, and he got us to think about instead maybe an equation. So I'm thinking about that comment, um, the idea that you can't replicate love as a form. Um, there were comments about how uh, it seems really noteworthy that all the people experience Christ directly. It's not just a prophet leader. And that seems to fit with some of what you're saying about every voice being important, kind of that individual experience, that, that, that individual um, relationship and, uh, and, and confrontation with, with, with Christ. Uh, and it's got me thinking about this question of um, that you kind of started with um, and that El Rey brought out so beautifully through the experiences of the community of Christ uh, and that history. And this idea that we have to live with those that we have conflict with. And it struck me that we often try not to live with those <laughs> that we have conflict with, that we don't allow kind of other voices and we don't allow ourselves to be, um, you know, moved by, um, by that. Um, you know, what is it what does living with each other look like? Um, and, you know, maybe fourth and five, you know, lesson in that. So. I love that last question. And it seems um, that we, our society becomes more and more polarized because we separate ourselves from those that aren't thinking like ourselves. And there are, of course, algorithms that do that to us as well, um, that deliberately separate us from those that we don't want to listen to as much. And I, um, I, this is something I also talk about with my, my music students. It's critical to be a great leader. You've got to be a great listener, to be a great human, to be a great musician, to be playing in an ensemble. You must be listening. You that one word that people, uh, one phrase a lot of teachers use is listen as loud as you play. Uh, that it's critical that we are willing to engage with others, and in fact, it's it's important to have diversity of thought in order to really understand, even if that means it clarifies what we still are convinced about, perhaps, or ho hopefully it will also clarify our thinking in ways that allow us to change our thinking. That's also what conceptual change, what re refutational text is about. I mean, it's a little more direct, but it's about going, uh, being willing to hear and see what, what another thought is what, what another line of thinking is and engaging with that. Um, and perhaps it can be a, in a way that both sides find even something new that they didn't even know without each other, right? That kind of synergy. Um, I love that. Yeah. <clears throat> Let me take another, another direction here, slightly different. Um, comments thinking about the fact that fourth Nephi portrays hundreds of years of, of peace, um, but it comes to an end and people uh, eventually come to a divisive, a need for um, some individual itism, I guess, it raises the question or causes some of us to ask um, if, if we are converted, if we are hearing this lesson and we are converted, uh, what do we teach our children? What what do what can we do to make this make our own understanding and conversion continue for another generation or more? Well, I I um <laughs> this is a this a, a, a story comes to mind um, which is tragic um, the. And maybe this is a, a in contrast to what we would teach, you know, our subsequent generations. But there, uh, one of my 
friends had a political sign up in her yard uh, a few days ago, uh, saw on her camera, her like doorbell camera, that there was a young, not, not old, a young, um, maybe sixth grade boy that um, is not just opposed to the sign, but expresses, I won't go into the details, but expresses disgust that he could not have have developed without learning it from someone else. So I think maybe one of the things we could do is to model engaging with other people in positive ways and being willing to be okay with not agreeing on everything, but still loving and wanting to be with one another. Um, that includes in our families and in our community again, who our neighbors are and, you know, while we stand up for what we believe and our, con you know, our convictions and what we feel is important, we also, um, this is what, of course, Gandhi and many of these wonderful peace builders was talking about was loving the other, loving the, the so-called enemy. Of course, that was Christ's. I, I think more than anything, we cannot teach that and pass that on without modeling it. And uh, the world seems to be pushing against that kind of engagement um, and making it harder, but to, to do that, I would be very interested in anybody else's thoughts on that too. Uh, I can share a little story, Becky. I mean, it's very short. Um, it's, uh, I was, I, while I, I was doing peace studies in, in Bradford in the UK, there was a peace education uh, uh, convention so different peace educators came together to discuss how to teach children about peace. Um, and I went up to one of the teachers at one point and I said, uh, well, I, you know, I grew up in a, in a very religious home, a very LDS, you know, Mormon home. And my mom told us not to play with play guns, you know, and, uh, and that was kind of the peace education, part of the peace education I got. Uh, and then he, uh, he looked at me and he said, and look at you now, a peace student. And, and I, I just, for the first time, it, it was immediate link between what I had been taught as a child in my Mormon home and how that linked up to what I was studying and what I was doing in the world. And I just thought that that's, that's also something to be thought about. What are we teaching our children is, is, is ultimately what they take with them later and try to emulate. Yeah, that's beautiful. And what comes to mind is um, uh, <coughs> that we recognize the humanity of those we don't agree with, right? We recognize maybe perhaps where they're coming from. All of us are complex creatures. We all have desires um, that uh, motivations that are usually a mix of things. And all of us, I, I, I what I, I hope to recognize those I engage with is that they are hoping for a better world in their own way. Um, and perhaps we're coming at it a different way, but that is their desire. But, but that's <laughs> that we recognize the humanity of those we may be in conflict with um, and also recognize what we have in common as well. Um, yeah, there was a great, there was a comment on chat about um, the kind of message to confront self, right? <laughs> and to look mm -hmm. at, and to look at that, um, and, and again, I'm just drawn to this idea of, and the great analogy with an orchestra and all of these voices mattering and recognizing um, the, the, the divinity in uh, like from El Rey's uh, prayer uh, this morning about uh, the divinity of um, all of us and, and each other um, and allowing people to experience uh, Christ and recognizing um, that in, in in everyone. You. Anything else? Um, um, I, 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 could I could I just ask you to um, maybe wrap up with a com couple of comments? Yes, that's what uh, I, was, I was going right there. No, yeah, you bet. Um, you have let, some. Let some me give you. Music let I, me give I, you the. Well, you go. Go. Well, okay. I was going to give you a, a question to wrap up with, but you, go ahead. You've got the ideas. 
Okay. Well, you can <laughs> ask your question. I love questions. So. <laughs> Um, the, the direction the question would go coming from some of the chat is that the, the, um, uh, what you have talked about and, and in a rich way is, is um, peace and diversity, peace with um, and, a, and a cooperative society with a lot of differences included in that society. And that, that's, um, that's uh, I, I don't know quite how to put a question mark on that, but that's one of the things I wanted to draw out from from what you've what you've told us today. Thank you. That is, I think, critical, and I, that's something that Sharon Eubank was talking about too, with the the going analogy that, that you can't just. It's a, a good. Uh, I don't even know crew or whatever is not made up of clones, right? It, it, each individual and their differences are important, but finding ways to, it, it really is, it's a, it's a tension. It's almost something that it's not one or the other, it's both, right? Being unified, right? Um, and, and finding ways to, to accomplish that. And, and the beauty that happened is illustrated, I think, in, of course, the very skeletal words of fourth Nephi, and then there's this this warning. I mean, it is a and I I, I hesitate almost. It's such a beautiful discussion. I hes, hesitate to to end this way, but I, it is a tragedy. Um, and I was up with uh, a, a one more kind of question about what happened to them. What's interesting in that that you have at first every year of peace acknowledged, right? The 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 35th, the 36th, and then they're all con, you know, converted, whatever that means. I know there's a question about that. I, I loved that question. And then, you know, the next year, but then it starts to become the decade, right? Um, in, in, a, in a few verses later, it's decades of peace. And then it starts to become a generation and then the next generation. And what I wonder, the first few years of peace, it was so wonderful and they acknowledged that they had this peace in contrast and they remembered where they were coming, horrible divisions where they were. But I wonder if over time that became taken for granted, if it was just sort of what they thought was just the way it was going to be forever. And they had forgotten what they could lose, where they had come from. Had they forgotten history? Had they forgotten what could happen if they lost the ability to engage with in if they lost the ability to have a society where all were treated in just and equal ways. And I wanted to bring in this incredible piece of music, uh, under-recognized piece of music by Ims. Uh, it's a, his setting of the Dona Nobis Pachem. Many people have, have um, made musical settings to that, but his is in a, is particularly interesting as far as its history and background. He wrote in 1936, he's English, he's there in Europe. He is the impending war, that he's feeling what's happening again as society around him is unraveling in Europe. He knows where they've come from only a decade, a couple decades before, not even, and he feels where they're going. And it's a cry, a literal cry for peace. Grant us peace. Of course, the text is Dona Nobis Pacem, grant us peace. And it's from the Catholic, it starts from the Catholic mass. Uh, it's uh, Anus Dei, uh, Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world, grant us peace. But then what he does is he uses a number of different texts. He uses Walt Whitman poems uh, about war, um, and about reconciliation. And he also uses uh, the text of a political speech from the time, that's a warning. And then in the end, it ends quite triumphantly. He uses text from the Bible talking about the sort of millennial experience, the, 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 um, the, the nation shall not lift up sword against nation. And I'll, 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 I'll give you a couple excerpts. The whole piece of course is 37, it's long, I, we won't do that, but I wanted to share a few excerpts of this and we'll walk you through them and, and share with you and give you a flavor for it. And my, I exhort you to go um, 
day or another part of your day, listen to the entirety and really uh, attend to the text as well. Um, Michael, would you play the first excerpt for us? So you can see um, in the cry for peace, you can hear in the cry for peace, there's this fragility of peace um, that it's, it's fragile. And you, uh, what happens next in, in the, the music, he goes into a Walt Whitman poem called Beat Beat Drums. And it's, it discusses how war is tearing through the land. And you hear in, in the beginning there, the sort of foreshadowing of those drums and war. Um, and then there's a section called Reconciliation, and he uses this Walt Whit Whitman poem here, uh, word over all beautiful as the sky, beautiful that war and all its deeds of carnage must in time be utterly lost. 
that the hands of the sisters death and night incessantly softly wash again an ever soiled world. And then you hear this next part, which I'll actually you, um, Michael, this is the, the one minute clip, um, a, a baritone solo. Oh, my enemy is dead. A man divine as myself. Just a quick um, note, isn't that haunting? Um, Von Williams uses a, a technique called word painting so many times. And just then you heard um, as, as he touches the face, the, the voice and the orchestra actually are playing the same notes uh, um, in unison. Um, and this happens actually a few times as well. I'll just tell you just a little bit about the last excerpt here. The, the, um, there's the place where, again, in these triumphant sections using biblical text, uh, there's uh, forever and ever, and it goes over in this loop as in eternity over and over and over. Um, so that's another word painting experience. And then again, after all this triumphant, this, was, this is what we could have, he then ends on a bit of a question mark, again, reminding us this is fragile. Um, what we can attain is there, but this is fragile. And he ends on something called an imperfect authentic cadence, where uh, the, the, the last chord is a tonic, it's called the tonic chord or a, a able chord, but yet it's not, it's imperfect. It ends on the third of the chord, so it's not as stable as it would if you ended on the note. So again, he ends on this question mark.
The glory of this latter house shall be greater than the former. And in this place will I be. 
Our Father in heaven, we are grateful for the Sabbath day. We are grateful for the Book of Mormon. We are grateful for this lesson. And we pray that um, our minds and hearts may be open in self-awareness that we may be able to confront ourselves, that we may uh, create unity, not only in diversity and inclusion, but through the establishment of justice. We pray that we may see God, see as God sees them and act accordingly. We pray that we may love our enemies and be free with mercy and grace as we seek to be makers of peace and establish thy end. And we say these things in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Amen. Thanks, Christine. Amen. I...